can understand its behavior and how it moves. Okay. So we'll get started with a few basic, very basic definitions, so that we use repeatedly throughout the course, and we'll study a few very uh, standard structures today. Okay. So let's get started with a very simple term, which is <coughs> kinematics. Right. You'll hear this term very often. Kinematics or kinematics, right? Kinematic or kinematics is basically studying the motion <coughs> studying the motion of a structure, of a mechanical structure. Without considering its mass. So in this case, you don't consider the mass of the manipulator. So we will not consider the mass of the joints, the links, and so on. At this point, we will only study the <coughs> motion or the workspace of a manipulator, assuming that it does not have a mass. So we'll just use skeletal structures. In this case, we only use <coughs> okay, we don't consider the mass. What happens if we consider the mass? When you consider the mass, it becomes dynamics. Okay. In the case of dynamics, mass of, of the mechanical structure taken into account. Okay. So that is a basic distinction between uh, kinematics and dynamics. So we'll go to dynamics in the later half of the course where we start uh, talking about control loops, inverse dynamics, and so on. For now, we'll concentrate on kinematics. This will be a first uh, important chapter when it comes to talking about manipulators. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, if you look at uh, industrial robots, industrial robots come in two types: okay. industrial robots or manipulators. There are two types, either a serial manipulator or a parallel manipulator. Okay. These are two broad classifications of the types of manipulators we normally see, serial or parallel manipulators. Let me talk closely uh, a little bit about parallel, and then we will entirely focus our attention to see. Both serial and parallel manipulators are nothing but kinematic chains. These are known as kinematic chains. Kinematic. A kinematic chain is nothing but a arrangement of Links and joints. Okay. It is a arrangement of links and joints. So you have a collection of links. So they are joined to each other in a particular fashion. The only distinction between a serial and parallel manipulator is that a parallel manipulator is a closed kinematic chain. A parallel manipulator. is a closed kinematic chain. As opposed to a serial manipulator, which is open. Okay? We'll get to the serial manipulator, but a parallel manipulator is a closed kinematic chain. So if you have a chain like this, Okay. 
example like this. So this is a rocking mechanism. It will rock like this, forward and backward. And this rocks, this will go in this direction. This is an example of a closed kinematic chain. Okay? This could be inverted, or it could be, in this case, why do we call it a closed kinematic chain? Because it forms a closed loop. There is no, every link is connected to the other one, and these two are fixed links. Here. This is an example of a closed chain. So you have three links, one, two, three, and you have four joints in this case. What is the function of joints in any chain? What does the, the, the a joint allow you to do? Huh? It gives you the uh, freedom to move to create relative motion. So any joint, whenever you have joint, joint allows for relative motion between two links. The joint allows for... have a joint between connecting two links, the joint will allow for a different type of motion to happen between this. Let's hold this thought for later. We'll talk more about joints in a moment. So these power manipulators are usually used when there is when you need a lot of torque, a lot of force, or a, the payload is very high. Okay. So we will not. The other type of power manipulator that you will see is something as we saw in the video. It has a lot of arms like this, cooperative arms, and then you can have a grip like here, an end of it. So you have joints here, or joints here. This is also a closed chain. Okay. So there can be different types of closed chains. The whole idea is it should form a closed loop. You have a question? Your joint allows for relative motion between two links. Okay, relative motion between two links. All right. <coughs> Let's go to serial manipulator. When we talk about a serial manipulator, the chain is not closed. If I remove this, Now it becomes a serial chain. So a serial manipulator is an open kinematic chain. Okay. A serial manipulator is an open kinematic chain. The simplest form of a serial manipulator is like this. A very you have two joints here. It's a very simple and straightforward manipulator. It's an open kinematic chain. Okay. So it does not close like the previous one. All right. So one end at the end of this, this one is grounded. So one end is grounded. Grounded is probably not the right word to use. One end of the manipulator. Okay. So one end of the manipulator is completely fixed. The other end holds an end effector, or normally what we call is a gripper or a tool, right? So the other end. is either, it could be a tool, it could be a welding tool, a painting tool, whatever it is, or a gripper, where you can hold stuff, or normally we call it an end effector. An end effector is a general term, that means you can have anything, any form of manipulation, gripping, holding, or tool, okay? So we will generally use the term end effector, E. What it means is this part is your end of
let's talk about joints. Okay. As I said, joints will give you the option of creating relative motion between two adjoining legs. Okay. Now, what type of joints can we have? What type of relative motion can we create between two legs? Exactly. Those are two basic forms of motion. One is angular motion, the other one is linear motion. Okay? We can, they can have relative motion. This produces relative motion. It can be clearly of two types, right? It could be linear motion or it can be angular motion. Okay? That's how you can have a joint. Now, this is a type of joint. For example, your elbow joint, this creates angular motion because you're moving your elbow like this. So these types of joints basically will have, or these are known as, let's talk about linear first and then I'm going to control. Okay. A linear joint is also known as a prismatic joint. A prismatic joint will create motion which is linear. So, for example, So you can have motion in this direction, backward or forward, and we represent the displacement by D. Every prismatic joint, the displacement of a prismatic joint is represented by D. So it can move in this direction, or it can move back, right, forward or backward, okay? So D is the displacement of the joint, and it only moves in one direction. It can move forward or backward, okay? So this is linear motion, okay? So motion is linear in this case. Backward depends upon how you align it. It could be up and down. The way we represent this usually, we don't unless this is a 3D uh, representation. In 2D, we will always represent a prismatic joint like this. Sometimes like this. This means that this joint is going to move like this. Okay. You'll have it a box and a line. And you will say that this is B. Sometimes you will also see the representation as follows. So Q, and then this face is drawn as this face here. Or let me use a different color so it's a little more obvious. you'll see a joint represented like this. You'll not see a joint represented like this. When you draw a man player, you'll see it like this. D is the displacement. In 2D, it will be represented like this. In 3D, it will be like this. Uh, Doctor, uh, the part between the manipulator and uh, the end of the, of the length is considered as a joint or...? I'm going to come to that. Oh. I'll, I'll talk about it. Okay. That's also a joint. It's also a joint. So it's clear here, this is a 2D representation of a prismatic joint, this is a 3D representation. 
When we come to the angular joints, angular motion, Joint is represented by the letter P, and this is represented by the letter R. Okay. We just call it a P joint or an R joint. R means a revolute joint. Okay. So in this case, the joint is like this. I'm going to draw a diagram like this one here. position of this to a final position of this. So here the displacement, the angular displacement is represented by theta, right? Now what sort of a motion is this? Angular, linear, what, what kind of a motion is it generating? Angular, what else? Angular and rotation is the same. Right, rotational motion or angular motion is the same. Okay, if I displace it by an angle, it is moving about an axis. Okay. Is there any rotational motion in this case when it when it translates like this? So when it when it's moving like this in this direction, is there any rotational motion associated with it? No. no. Okay. Perfect. Now when I do this, I'm rotating about this point. So I have a rotational motion. Is there any linear motion? Huh? Yes or no? Why? Why? Hmm? So a angular joint or a revolute joint is not only <coughs> rotating about this axis, it's also displacing. If I track a point P here, P x comma y. Now it's going to a new point P dash, which is X dash comma Y dash. Okay. So a revolute joint will not only have angular motion, but it's moving in two directions. It's also moving in X and Y direction. So it will also have linear motion. Okay. So a prismatic joint will have no angular component associated with it. But if I use a revolute joint when I'm turning about this point or about the, this axis, when I do this, I'm not only move, generating an angular displacement, I'm also generating a linear displacement because this point has been displaced from here to this new position, P dash. Now, whenever you have motion, motion should be defined along certain axes, right? So in this case, when you have linear motion, linear motion is about an axis that is parallel to the direction, it is like this. This is the z, we call it the axis of motion. We usually reserve z. So it is along this axis, that is it's moving. This is the axis of motion. Which is along the axis. This is the axis of motion, it is along an axis. If I want motion about this axis, then I'll generate a joint which will be like this. It will be like that, about that axis. But if I want a, about any random axis, then I'll align my z axis along that vector and I'll generate a motion about this. Okay, how about this? Where is the axis to define the motion of an angular joint? How do we define the axis for an angular motion? So I see along the north. Along what? North. So in this case, whenever you have a rotation, a rotation is about an axis which is perpendicular to the plane of the motion. So if it is moving like this, if this is moving, the axis of rotation is this. So I'm moving it like this, 
or if it's the thumb points in the direction of motion. So if I'm moving like this, my axis is within the board, or it can be perpendicular. It's always perpendicular. So in this case, the motion is about the axis, which is perpendicular to the face of the motion. Okay. So for example, if I want to turn this about an axis like this, then this is my axis of rotation. I'm rotating about this. Okay. You cannot have a axis, a rotational axis within the plane of the rotation. So in this case, here we will define this uh, rotation like this as, I'm sorry, it's the opposite direction, like this, T. Okay. So here, this is rotation about the Z axis. And this axis is perpendicular, perpendicular to the plane of rotation. So two important things that you have to bear in mind is the axis of motion. In this case, it is along the axis. This is above the axis. Okay. Here it is parallel. Both of these are parallel. The displacement and the axis are parallel. They are in the same direction. This is perpendicular. So based on how these links and joints are arranged, we can generate different types of motion or we can have different manipulator structures. So when we have a manipulator structure, we usually represent a manipulator structure like this. I say it's a 6DOF. Or let me just say 3D work for now. 3D work. R, R, R. What does that mean? Three degrees of freedom. It has three revolute joints. Okay. This means it has three degrees of freedom. define what type of a manipulator structure it is. Now, what do we mean by a degree of freedom? The ability to move. The ability to move. In any direction. Huh? In any direction. In any, not in any direction. That will, if you have any direction, you need more than one degree of freedom. Okay. A one degree of freedom, a degree of freedom is DOF or degree of freedom. be along an axis or about an axis. So this is one degree of freedom joint. This is a one DOF joint. This is also a one DOF joint. Can you have a joint that has more than one degree of freedom? Huh? Yes or no? So for example, you have your shoulder, right? You can move your shoulder like this. This is one degree of freedom. You can move it up and down and you can also twist your arm. Okay. So this is a three degree of freedom joint. Okay, if you consider your shoulder joint. So degrees of freedom, a joint can have more than one, a minimum of one. A joint should have a joint should have a minimum of 
one degree of freedom. However, this is not, there are fixed joints, but we will not talk about this for the purpose of this course. But let's assume for now that a minimum of one degree of freedom should be assigned to a joint. But, or it can be more. Okay, sometimes you can have two degrees of freedom or three degrees of freedom. An example of this is your shoulder joint. It's a ball and socket joint, you represent it like this. Okay, this is a three degree of freedom revolute joint. You have three degrees of freedom. This is an example of a joint that has three degrees of freedom. Your elbow is a two degree of freedom joint. So you can move from here, you can move like this. You can also move up and down. So elbow will have a two degree of freedom. How about the wrist? Hmm? You can move your wrist like this. You move it up and down. So it has three degrees of freedom. Any guess on how many degrees of freedom a human body has? Huh? Around 300. <laughs> yes, you have so many joints in your spine, you have your knees, shoulder. Some of these joints have more than two or three degrees of freedom. Okay. So when you look at a manipulator, let's look at a clear manipulator here. So this is, let's say this is a n degree of freedom, uh, let's say there are n number of links, so, or n joints, so this, I'm just going to write this as a NDOF manipulator. NDOF, that means if you have n joints, they can be revolute, prismatic, we don't care at this point. Now, there are two things that we have to understand here, which is, how how does the position of the end effector change when I change the displacement? So for example, if I'm moving a joint, what is happening is I'm turning this, I'm creating a displacement here. So if I change this, for example, if this theta, if I change this theta 1, let's call, let's assume it's revolute, this is theta 2, and let's say this is theta 3 for now. Okay. These are three revolute joints, and their displacement is like that. Now, normally, all applications, uh, industrial applications, require two things, two very important things. One is positioning the end effector. So you want to get to a particular point, which is positioning. And the second one is orientation. That means reaching a point is not just enough, but you have to reach it in the correct orientation. For example, if I want to hold this, some applications might not want me to pick it up like this. They might want to pick it up like this, right? So reaching a point with a particular orientation is as important as getting to that particular point. So positioning, you define by the positioning, obviously, by the three independent variables, x, y, z, right? And orientation, you need to define an orientation. We usually do P, theta, and psi. Okay. So the position of the end effector at all instances is reflected by these six independent variables that will define both the position and orientation. Okay. So we can write that x, which is the position of the end effector, will be P. And O. That means position and orientation. 
Position, again, is defined by three variables, x, y, and z, and you have your orientation as phi, theta, and psi. <coughs> So six independent variables. To define both the position and orientation. Okay. Most industrial manipulators, the way they are built is we use these we use these links to get to that particular position, but we might not achieve the orientation. For example, if I want to reach here, so I might only have this orientation, let's say, or let me just be very rational here and say this is the only orientation that I have. What if I want to generate an orientation which is at this point is like this, in this direction. To do this, what we have is, we have a wrist, just like a human wrist here. So the manipulator, most industrial manipulators will have a wrist. This is a wrist, wrist joint. Wrist joint does not have a length. It is, it, it is actually three concentric three intersecting axes at one point. So you have a, if you, if you talk about a spherical wrist, so let's assume that this is a wrist joint. Wrist joint can have, there are different types of wrist joints. I'm just going to give you an example of a spherical wrist. So an example of this, and we'll study this in detail. The example is a spherical wrist. So with a spherical wrist, you can generate any possible orientation because you have three axes, rotation about all three mutually perpendicular axes, so you can get to any orientation that you want. The only thing that you have to bear in mind here is that if the, all these three joints are at one point and they don't have lengths like this, they don't have link lengths associated with it. So it's just going to be at one point, so you, it's like your wrist, there is not, it does not have a length like your forearm, it only has a, a 